While we're waiting for that to warm up, I'm Brian Milberg. I'm the energy manager for the city of Minneapolis. My job basically is to try and reduce the energy consumption for the operations of the city. So that would include our fleet, all of our trucks, cars, heavy duty trucks. It would include all of our buildings. We have almost 70 buildings that range in size from 500 square feet to the Minneapolis Convention Center, which is one and a half million square feet. And we're in Excel Energy's top 10 customers as a city. Our electricity bill is about $12.5 million a year. We use about 150 million kilowatt hours a year just for the city operations. And my job is to try and reduce that to save us money and certainly to lower our carbon footprint. So I'll give you, today I'll give you a little background of what we're doing in the city. We'll talk about some of our current solar installations and uh, some of our future efforts that we're just getting involved in. We like to show this picture mainly because it's their summer and it looks great. But uh, basically what we try to tell people is while I'm the energy manager, I work in amongst a larger group which is really involved with sustainability. I don't know how many of you know Gail Prest. She's our director of sustainability. And we're trying to make Minneapolis a more livable city. And that certainly in includes our carbon footprint as well as all of the uh, things you see such as clean water, locally grown food, um, urban green space, livable communities, and the like. The city actually has 26 sustainability indicators. And these have been built up over the last five years amongst the city staff as well as um, citizen input. And they're set as 10-year performance measures. And we actually produce a report every year. And I'll show you where you can get that. It's actually very interesting. It's a very well done report. Each of these indicators gets a full page, sometimes two pages worth of explanation of what we've done each year to make the city a more livable place. All the departments in the city, public works, finance, uh, community uh, development, the police, fire, everybody has a role in these. And <clears throat> two of the biggest indicators, the ones that I'm involved with mostly are, we have the goal of having one megawatt of renewable energy by 2014. And we have a citywide goal for the city operations to reduce our carbon footprint by one and a half percent every year. And we've been doing that since 2006, and we're actually two years ahead of our goal. As I said, we get an annual report, and I'll give you the website for this. It's actually got a lot of pictures, a lot of graphs. It's very informative and tells you all the various things that we've been doing. And it also does not sugarcoat when we miss the goals. Some, a lot of these goals we set, and they're pretty far-reaching. And sometimes we miss them, but we talk about what needs to be done, and we don't necessarily change the goal. We just talk about what we have to do to get there. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the city. This, again, is all about Minneapolis, the city limits of Minneapolis, what our progress has been in 2010. And we had the highest number of renewable energy permits pulled in the city. We had 28 photovoltaic installations had permits pulled. That was uh, seven times what we had in 2007. We only had four <coughs> in 2007. We had four thermal permits and 19 geothermal permits. We also worked with our permitting people and the ordinances in the city, and we developed a lower fee for the permit. And we have a checklist now so that you don't have the permit people who may not necessarily know as much about solar as we think they should know. They have a checklist to follow. They don't have to be experts. They don't have to be surprised. It's all right there in a checklist, and they just walk down that checklist, and it makes for a much faster permit approval. This year, we, in the city of Minneapolis, four schools got five kilowatt systems. That was through grants through the Walmart Corporation, and they actually have curriculum in each of the schools that then takes the children through how the solar works, and they have monitoring. They can watch what it's producing every day. And they actually produced a curriculum that's part of their science education in each of these schools. Uh, we're very proud of our convention center. We have 601 kilowatts. It's the largest PV installation in the upper Midwest. 
and that was with the uh, Renewable Development Fund. We received $2 million from Excel's RDF fund to put towards that project. And that actually is the largest uh, PPA in Minnesota. So we don't actually own that facility. It's owned by a <coughs> developer, and we are just purchasing the electricity on a 20-year fixed contract. We're paying a slight premium now, but in about four years, as Excel continues its inexorable march of 3% a year average price increase, we'll actually be paying less than what we're paying now. We also have a uh, fire station. I'll show you some pictures where we just completed a 9.6 kilowatt system, and that was with 10K solar panels. So it's a little unusual for us. It was our first installation of 10K solar. And we also finished implementing 200 solar charged parking meters. It's a somewhat unusual meter. I'll show you some pictures of that. I don't know if anybody's parked at any of them yet, but they're actually multi-space meters. There's not one at every space. You have poles that have numbers on them, but every tenth space is this parking meter. And you just type in your number of the space you're in when you pay your money there. And they're all solar powered. Well, this is top of fire station 19. Uh, it's a 1965, 1970 building. Um, it has a fairly strong roof. We didn't have to do any roof support whatsoever. But on the left, you can see here they're laying down the rails. And within one day with five people, they had all the rails in place, all of the panels up, and all of the ballast. And that was uh, 61 panels. They uh, took about another two days to do all of the electrical. Uh, the main reason for that is we had Excel's requirement that the disconnect meter be outside along with the production meter. So there was actually a fairly extensive run that had to be made. Even though the original meter is inside the building and they didn't require us to move the original meter. So as usual, we typically have some little uh, niceties to deal with our utility every time we do an installation. But that is going to be coming online here in the next week or two. Here is a shot just as they had put all the panels up on the roof. Quick question. I'm yes. What made you guys choose this particular fire station over the rest? What, uh, this particular fire station? Yeah. We received funds from the state of Minnesota okay. that they originally got from the federal government as stimulus funds. And that's known as the EIC fund. It's the Energy Innovation Corridor where the light rail line is going between St. Paul and Minneapolis. Within a quarter mile on either side of that light rail line, each city got one and a half million dollars to install solar wherever we could on any city-owned buildings. And this fire station is right off of Washington Avenue. It's literally 50 feet from where the light rail is going in. You can't even get over to see it anymore because you can't get over there. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, that's why we chose this fire station. We have another fire station downtown, which is just two blocks off of the light rail, that we're putting a solar thermal system on. And this actually, in the far right-hand corner, will also get a solar thermal system. It just hasn't been installed yet. It'll be 120 square feet. It'll just do the domestic hot water for the station. We also, as I said, we have these solar parking meters. On the top of that meter is maybe about a square foot of solar panel. It probably can't be more than 10 or 15 watts. I don't have the specifications. But that charge is enough to charge the battery inside that unit and uh, keep track of all the parking. So you walk up to that. There's little poles with parking space numbers. You just pick which number you're in and uh, put your money in. It takes cards as well as change and dollar bills. And there's another 150 of these that are going to be going in in the next three months. So the city is moving towards this in all of its parking areas. Does it, do they have these charge sheets? The charger, I want to talk about that. The city has several electric vehicles, and we are going to be putting three electric vehicle charging stations in the Hoff parking ramp. That's on the corner of 4th Street and 5th Avenue. So it's just right next to the grain exchange building. And that parking, three spaces there, the charging will be free. Once you pay your parking fee, you can charge there for free. 
and that'll be going in in the next two or three months. That's a Coulomb charger. It can all be downloaded through an app. You can see if it's available or not, and it tracks everything for us in the city. We know who's using it, when it's being used, and how long, how many people we're getting, and what the uh, economics of it are. <clears throat> now we have several other projects that we're involved in through the end of this year and they got slowed down because the money is coming from the state and we were all shut down for a month so that threw everything into a tizzy. But we have our Curry maintenance facility which is going to get a 40 kilowatt system and that's going to be installed by Able Energy. The system on the fire station was installed by Sundial and we also have 100 kilowatts that's going on the Royalston maintenance facility. That's also going to be by Able Energy. And then we have the Hoff parking ramp. And I'll show you some pictures of this, uh, which will be the first parking ramp in Minnesota that will have a major solar facility. We actually are building a steel superstructure on the very top level of the ramp. That will be going in during the month of, hopefully by September 15th, we'll have that finished. And then we'll follow up by putting 40 kilowatts of PV directly on top of that ramp. And that will be tied into the building, which during the day will run these three chargers as well as provide uh, power to the building. And then we have two solar thermal uh, fire stations. We have this fire station 19 is getting a solar thermal. And then fire station 1, which is actually just a block away from the Hoff ramp, is getting three solar panels as well for their domestic hot water. And again, as I stated before, the extra parking meters and the uh, three charging stations. This is a, on the left is a bird's eye view of our Royalson facility. On the left with the light gray roof is our shop. We uh, take care of, or excuse me, on the upper right hand corner is the shop. That's where all of the fleet vehicles, all the police cars, all of the small light trucks get their maintenance. And <clears throat> we have about 20 bays in there for uh, mechanical repairs on the vehicles. On the left hand side, on the light gray, is an office area. And basically we're taking that entire upper flat roof, which has very tight structural requirements. We're only allowed five pounds per square foot. The building was not built for solar, it's something we're finding with most of our buildings. Actually our older buildings are more capable of carrying solar than the newer buildings because the newer buildings were built as inexpensively as possible. Why waste money building a strong roof? Because we know we're not going to add another story. So the roofs, while they're certainly strong enough to stand, sustain, uh, sustain the uh, wind and the snow loads, they really cannot take solar. So we've had to actually scratch several buildings from our uh, selection process because of that. But we're getting uh, 101 kilowatts on this. It'll be a fairly standard system. It'll have one inverter on the first floor and a uh, string series, fairly typical system. Where is that located? That is located almost directly across the street from the New Twins ballpark. If you take 7th Street around Target Center and then it winds in front of the Twins ballpark, as your, the Twins ballpark is on your right, this is on your left. Unfortunately, I don't have a better picture for you, but this is the Hoff parking ramp. This is about one-sixth of the top floor, but the um, rectangular lines on this drawing are the actual steel beams that are going to be put in. It's a 64-foot spread. We're going to have one beam going that entire length. It's going to be very interesting when we deliver this steel. I'll be taking pictures from a block away, not real close, <laughs> while we raise that steel. And they tell me they're going to put that up in three days. So we'll see how that goes. And then because that building is actually 30 degrees off of south, the uh, panels are drawn there. You can see the diagonal lines are the actual panels that we place there. And that'll be 40 kilowatts. That is actually going to be using microinverters because the length of line from that spot to the main metering section is quite far. And so we're actually, it was cheaper, we found, and made more sense to go with microinverters on the back of every panel and just send the AC down to the metering room instead of DC. 
This also has a very interesting uh, situation. We are in the middle of Excel's network where all of the buildings downtown are tied in together. And I'm a chemical engineer, not an electrical engineer. I don't understand it, but they have yet more requirements because of this. And one of the unusual requirements of this facility is we are now allowed to produce more than 50% of the power that Excel is feeding in at any one time. So if 100 kilowatts of power is coming, is the building is using 100 kilowatts of power, I can only produce 33, while Excel supplies 66 to make up that 100. So we have to have sophisticated relay hardware ahead of the disconnect. You can't have a dumb disconnect. Actually, it has to be a programmable disconnect to monitor the incoming power against what we're producing and open up some of these circuits. The, well, because they're microinverters, it just stops producing. We can actually take the strings of microinverters and open up selective strings to lower the amount of power produced. So it's a somewhat unusual situation, and uh, I won't say we're exactly thrilled about the situation, but uh, that's what we're having to do. This is a real issue in most of the larger downtowns in the United States, trying to feed it back into the grid when they have these network uh, connections. I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about the convention center. It's our largest facility. It's been up and running now for six, actually almost eight months now. And we've got a lot of good data. And I can certainly talk about that. I just want to say the convention center is quite large, a million and a half square feet. It was built over two different stages. And actually, it's applying for LEED existing building certification this year. And the solar was part of getting points for that LEED existing building rating. The system is 600 kilowatts of power. We estimate it's going to do 750,000 kilowatts annually. It's got 2,600 panels <coughs> divided up into quite a series of arrays. And I'll show you a picture of that. Because the convention center has those four domes, we avoided the domes, but they cast shadows, so we had to avoid the shadows. And we're covering about two football fields worth of area on the roof. That actually, we could have put a system with all of the flat area. We probably could have about five times as many panels there. But I'll show you when I get to the drawing why we chose this size system. It can produce about 20% of the daytime electricity. It's about 5 to 8% of its annual electric bill. The facility actually uses almost as much in the evening, and I'll show you its demand curve. It's somewhat unusual. It actually uses more power on non-peak days than it does peak days. And many times, it's using more power at 7, 8, 9 at night than it does in the afternoon, early <coughs> afternoon. So it's a somewhat unusual situation. And again, this was funded through the Excel Energy RDF fund. So here's the convention center, and you see the domes. And each of these little sections, the panels, you can see the little cross hatches all over the place. And it had to be divided up because these are all different elevations. There's not one section next to the next section that's flat. There could all be three or five feet higher or lower from each other. About the only section that's flat is here. But they're all divided by parapets and other access ports. So it all had to be divided up into um, various areas. And that is segmented into six different inverters. They're almost equal. They get between 95 and 100 kilowatts each. The other reason that we didn't use all of the flat roof is every single one of these panels sections, except for the very upper right, is over non-public areas. They're either on top of mechanical rooms, which have another floor, or they're over the loading docks and uh, non-public areas. So if there is a leak in the roof, it's not going to go where the actual convention center patrons are. So that was another decision we made. The other decision point, part of the RDF grant, you'll notice the upper right-hand side, the panels are 30 degrees off to the southwest. The rest are due south. And that was part of the grant. We're measuring how that affects the demand curve of the building. We don't get as much total electricity off of those panels that are mounted off to the southwest, but we are getting more afternoon energy. And we're looking at modeling that for Excel to see if 
other facilities uh, make sense to go in the southwest because of the late time demand like we have later in the day. So we spent $3 million putting a brand new roof on this building. And the original, the original plan was it was going to be a non-penetrating system. And because everything had to be divided up so much on the building, it turned out we had to penetrate. So we took this brand new roof and cut 174 holes in it, <laughs> which was very painful to watch. But they got it down to a science. They made a template. They cut right through all the... Uh, the membrane, it's a reflective membrane. They cut right through it, right through the insulation, right down to the steel deck. They installed the very first plate, and then they installed the standoff directly on that. And within an hour, they had that. Totally sealed off, ready to go. We've got 175 of these. We haven't had a single leak. And in this spring and summer, that's, that's saying something. <laughs> So that worked out very well, but it was, it was painful. Uh, here are the panels. This is Unirac, um, the system, their newest system. Uh, it's a fairly heavy steel gauge rail that's set on the roof. Typically, you can see the roof supports there underneath the black uh, membrane supporting the rail, but the rail was then actually attached to these standoffs as well. The standoffs were not there to bear the weight of the rack, they were only there for wind. So the rack was being supported by the roof itself. The standoffs were just to tie it down for wind resistance. Was that the ISIS system? Yes, that was the ISIS system. Here, uh, once the racks are in place, you can see they have some of the vertical supports and they're placing the uh, panels. It took, they, I believe they had between eight and 10 people working on both the racking and the panels, and it took three weeks to put in 2,600 panels. And here's just one section of it. What type of panels did you guys use? Uh, those were silicon, 230 watt. The silicon, S I, not silicon, silicon, out of California. One of the requirements for all our projects is everything has to be U.S. made because all of our funding comes from the federal government. So all the panels, all the racking, all the inverters, everything has to be made in the U.S. What kind of efficiency does that have? Uh, this is rated at 14.5% efficiency. I, can, I have some curves here we can show, I believe. This just shows what happens at the convention center. The green line is an average of every days for a year. That's the average demand over every 15 minutes is a single point on that green line. And so you see that it ramps up between 9 and 10 in the morning, and it's pretty constant on an average day. But on this particular day, it was the red line. And as you can see, around 3.30, 4 o'clock, all of a sudden, they started to have a peak. Well, what probably happened is they, started really, they probably had a late convention coming in, or they opened up an ex exhibition hall where they turned on 500, 1,000 watt metal halide lights, and they got a peak that lasted up until 6 o'clock. Well, on a day like that, I could be putting out my 600 kilowatts, and the building's using 4,000, so it's a fairly decent amount of power I'm putting out, but unfortunately by 6 o'clock, I'm only putting out 50 kilowatts. And so the peak for the day, it's almost as if I didn't exist as far as the billing is concerned. So one of the things that we found in this, over the eight months we've been doing this, is that our average demand, we're actually reducing our demand about 100 kilowatts a day, <coughs> regardless of the day. That's what it's averaging. And yet on the actual bill, we're only seeing a demand reduction of 10 to 30 kilowatts because of this strange pattern we have on our demand curve. So one thing I caution people when they call me and they say, what's your experience? And I want to put on a commercial building. You know, I'm going to save all this demand. And I go, well, you may not. Because of the way the tariff is written, you may not. You'll certainly save on your, power, on your um, kilowatt hour consumption, but you may not save much on your kilowatt demand charge every month. 
because we're paying for that 15 minute peak whenever it occurs. Um, this is averaging over the first six months of data and the blue line is an average. So obviously as we go through an average day or at solar noon, we're getting a little over 300 kilowatts on an average. The highest I've seen is, out of our 600 kilowatts so far is 570, 570. The light pink line or whatever we want to call that color is actually the standard deviation and you'll see it's quite high. We have days, especially in the early spring when it was raining constantly, we had days we literally never got above 20 to 50 kilowatt hours, or kilowatts, excuse me, in power out of 600. And yet we have days now in June and July we're getting close to 600. So as an average, we're getting around 310, 320 at peak. One of the things that we did from this installation and now we're using it in all of our other installations when we go out and bid a project when we select a bidder we do not select who has the lowest price per kilowatt we actually require the bidders to guarantee how many kilowatt hours you're gonna produce me this year and we take their price subtract off any rebates that are applicable then divide that number by the kilowatt hours that they guaranteed so we've had many, many discussions about how do you determine how many kilowatt hours you're going to produce. And what we've been using is the PV Watts program, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And you get into a big argument over what are you going to use for a D-rate factor. And we let the contractors pick their own D-rate factor. They can pick anything they want, but they have to stand by that many hours. And what's been very interesting with the convention center is we modeled this at 0.77 for a D-rate factor which is the kind of default number that PV Watts uses. Is anybody following this? Is there, do people, okay. We got a lot of pushback on that. And I check this every month. I look at what PV Watts says I should have produced that month on an average and what we actually produced. And that D rate factor has gone anywhere from 0.5 when we've had a lot of clouds, you know, obviously a very cloudy, non-normal month to we've been as high as 0.88. And actually up till last month, I haven't done August data yet through mid-August, but through mid-July, we were at 0.75 for the year. So it, it's been very interesting to watch these numbers go up and down, up and down, and yet overall, that PV Watts number has been very, very close to what we're getting. It's been, it's been uh, very surprising. So by, you, you make contractor actually guaranteed what is the mechanism that you've set up if they don't meet those guarantees we flog them cut, cut you a yeah. <laughs> we just flog them yeah no what we do now is on our last several products what we do is we hold back a five percent retainer on the total job cost yep. and then at three months we see where we're at and if you're doing well if you've met the PV watts for the first three months, you get that retainer back. If you don't meet it, you get some back, and we wait to see what the full year does. So we are holding some money back. We've had a lot of arguments about this, but my boss, and we're part of Public Works, and this is kind of our philosophy. When we do any kind of construction for anything, we expect guarantees. When we build a building, we expect the materials to last a certain amount of time. We expect an HVAC system to produce at a certain efficiency rate. And we hold our contractors uh, liable for that. And so when we got the PV, they felt we need to do the same thing with that. And I, I know it's somewhat unusual, and we do get a lot of arguments about it, but we think it is the way to go, because that's what we're trying to do. We're not, we're not going to see the big demand charge drop in our buildings. A lot of our buildings are 24-7, like these maintenance facilities. And so we're only going to see it on what our uh, energy consumption is, not the power. If you were to do it over, would you point all the panels to the southwest? I haven't really analyzed enough yet, especially in the summer months, to know that. I, I really can't say. I do know that we are definitely getting less overall power out of them. So on that convention center, I probably would have pointed them all due south. We were just not going to see the demand reductions that we thought we were going to see. Back a couple of slides, I think you had both curves, and 
that did show in the afternoon that you picked up a little bit more off the <coughs> This one here? Yeah, this is those two lower curves that these two? Lines. No, that's I'm sorry, this is the maximum for the year of every fifteen minute. This is the average. It's actually a fairly smooth curve on average. This was an individual day's demand. I'm sorry, I, I didn't explain that well enough. There's no PV on this chart. This is just building demand. Is it kilowatts? Kilowatts. This is just demand. Oh, okay. So are you then monitoring the solar radiation on site? For yes, we have uh, with, through DEC monitoring, D-E-C-K. We monitor each of the six inverters every 15 minutes. It, actually, every five minutes it generates a five-minute interval value. So what about the solar radiation? Yes, we're measuring the solar radiation as well. And actually, we have uh, one pointed due south, and we actually have one pointing southwest. I want to talk a little bit some of our other initiatives. As I said, we're trying to reduce our carbon footprint by 1.5% every year. Uh, we do that in a variety of ways. Our fleet is now using biodiesel, and we're trying to push E85 through most of our passenger-type cars. We have uh, this new facility, the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility, which I'll show you a picture of, which is on a geothermal system. It's using about 50% less electricity. And uh, I shouldn't say electricity, about 50% total energy less than a regular office building would of its size. And we're also using WindSource, the Excel's WindSource program. We're buying 25,000 kilowatt hours a month just for that one building, paying a little extra for WindSource. And then one of my main jobs is spending this other bucket of stimulus money to retrofit all 70 buildings in the city that it owns through lighting retrofits, weather stripping, new building controls, uh, new HVAC systems, a whole variety of items. And we're about half, spent about half of that money so far. This is our uh, Hiawatha maintenance facility. It has LEED Platinum status. And the right-hand side was actually an old building that we gutted. <laughs> Instead of raising, we gutted it and refurbished it and then built a new portion just to the left, and behind it, this is the office area, behind that is a very large fleet maintenance where they do all of the really heavy trucks, garbage trucks, the huge snow plows, and that type of thing are done at this facility. It's right off of 26, if you know where the building is, excuse me, the bridge that goes over Hiawatha at 26th, the, uh, the footbridge, it's, it goes right into that property right across from that property. So again, I just wanted to come back to our sustainability uh, initiative. It's on City Talks, which is at uh, our city website. And we just released the 2010 report. And uh, it's actually pretty good reading. It uh, shows a lot of things we're doing. And it's very interesting between biking and livability and all kinds of health initiatives the city is doing, as well as the energy that I'm involved in. Why isn't it going? That's interesting. Hmm. I don't know how I got into that. There we are. Well, that's the end anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>
how do we compare as far as our uh, sustainability goals and how we rate ourselves? Our, on our sustainability goals, we're doing very well. On our renewable energy portfolio, we're doing very poorly. And the main issue there is the rate of electricity. We're paying one third to one half for electricity of what everybody else is on the two coasts. And we really have no state support for solar. I mean, we have the Excel Rewards program, but it is capped. And we have the Made in Minnesota, but that's also capped. And for solar thermal, you know, we had some rebates, but that hasn't gone too well. Um, these people on the coast, up until the last year or two, were basically putting in two and three times what our state had for incentives. Now, as they get higher in their tiers, you know, California has a tiered program. As they get more and more solar, the rebates are dropping. So their rebates are actually a little bit less than ours are now. But up until the last year or two, they were far ahead of us in rebates. Did you click on the actual report? Yeah, you have to get to the actual yearly annual report. And then, I would suggest some web pages. It's more obvious to filter. Okay. Yeah, we, we've got a lot going on. Okay. Any other? When you had mentioned having a standardized um, form for the permitting process, was that specifically for the city or something that you can do? Well, that, if that's for the city permit uh, to get your standard building permit. It's only right now, it's only for um, slanted roof direct attachment. We are working on a form, a checklist form for flat roof where you have to put racking. But this is where you know, the racking is right on the roof and you're basically following the roof line. That's what the checklist is for. It was somebody in the far back. Did you? I was just trying to get your Oh, attention. okay. You said you've uh, started comparing your bids based on dollars per kilowatt hour and yes. dollars per kilowatt. Have you had any uh, good comparisons using solar trackers since they produce more kilowatt hours per day? Um, we don't have any tracking in the city right now. We, one of the issues we have is we have this goal of one megawatt of solar, well, actually it's total renewable energy, but the truth is it's gonna all be solar. And with these, the convention center and the other projects I was talking about, we're up to about 800 of that 1,000 kilowatts. So we have 200 kilowatts left, and what, one of the things we're finding is we're not gonna get to that unless we start doing some ground-mounted systems. And when we get to the ground mount, then I think we definitely will be looking at trackers. But for building mount, it's too complicated. Well, that's what our structural engineers have told us. Our buildings just can't, we just can't do it. So, but what we will, we have land out at the water facility, which is right on the border of Fridley and Minneapolis up north. And that was one of the areas we're looking at for a significant ground mounted system. And then we definitely would look at trackers. Have you uh, considered a large thermal? St. Paul has one, megawatt size thermal. Yeah, we, St. Paul, Paul's thermal is tied into their uh, central energy district, which actually is a hot water system. We have a central energy district in Minneapolis, it's NRG, and we actually have several buildings. The convention center is on that, Target Center is on that, several of our office buildings are on that, but unfortunately that's a steam system, and so we can't, come close to approaching those kinds of temperatures to tie into their system. Um, we have looked at several buildings for hot water, but the truth is, other than our fire stations, we don't really, we don't have much of a summertime load on any of the buildings. No, no pools? With the city, well, it's possible. That's the park board. It's a different part of the city. <laughs> I forgot about that. It is a different organization. But we are doing some energy conservation projects with them. And we did try to, in this energy innovation corridor, the Brian Coyle Center, 
was one that we looked at, even though the park board owns that building, but the roof couldn't sustain the weight. So we actually did look at that. There was somebody over here, I thought. Maybe not. Um, new construction, we, I have to say that we've put two buildings in in the last three years, the Hiawatha facility, and we did another facility up near the water facility, and they did not try to include solar in there. But I wasn't part of the city then, <laughs> so we're not going to let that happen again. The, uh, the funding that Minneapolis has, and I apologize, I didn't get the whole presentation here, but has Minneapolis looked at trying to kind of disperse some of that money out in forms of financing to provide that for its citizens instead of doing these larger projects themselves, but trying to more mm -hmm. create more small distri distributed projects, providing financing, a fund for Minneapolis residents to actually be apply, apply into and actually receive funding. So that's, I think, a lot of, uh, if any of the installers mm -hmm. are in here. That's still, it's always, it's always, it's been an issue and it probably will continue to be an issue. There have been several neighborhood organizations that have been using money. Bryn Mawr is one of them, Linden Hills is uh, Kingsfield neighborhood is paying for assessment or solar assessments and uh, I can't remember if it's Linden Hills or Bryn Mars putting in $1,500 I think per system I but that's coming out of neighborhood grant money which is city money so there are some small programs uh, but the larger amounts of money that we have are federal stimulus dollars and it's really hard to steer those into small projects that are spread out you know, over a wide population. But I, it is an issue because, as I said, we have 70 buildings. I'd be surprised if we could even put solar on more than 30 of them, either due to shading issues or, like I said, the weight loads. You know, so it, it is limited. Brian, Doug? On electric vehicles, are you doing on electric vehicles, we, we have a multi-year plan to try and put more charging stations out. Right now, we're going to put these three in this one ramp. Um, the city has <laughs> purchased a few electric vehicles, but right now, they're mainly for service-type vehicles. They're not uh, fleet vehicles. They're not police cars or traffic-related. Um, I really don't know where they're headed with that, other than the more has been spent on trying to get more charging stations out than the actually purchase of electric vehicles. Um, you said there's an issue with the roof loading. Have you, is anything being done to change uh, your building designs and make it a requirement to have a roof which could handle solar in the future in the building? Well, that's, that's my goal for our next building, is to make sure that that's included and that it becomes one of the policies of the city. Three million dollars. Well, actually, out of that 1.9 million that we have from the federal government, about 500,000 of that is going to energy conservation in the convention center. They were two totally separate streams of money. Excel had $2 million out of the $3 million they were willing to put in, and that was for solar, not conservation, so. Uh, you, you need both, and, uh, it's yes. never enough money. Uh, I don't really get involved in that, so I, I really can't say. I do know for rental property, there has been a significant push on the energy efficiency side to get your renter's license to be able to rent, I believe it's four and above, or maybe it's five and above, um, domiciles in one facility. To get this renter's license, they have been increasing the energy efficiency requirements of the building. And they certainly have been getting pushback from contractors and certainly from existing stock but 
they're moving ahead with it. What would your ideal new city of Minneapolis building look like? I mean, would it have, I mean, you mentioned, yes, you could have solar, but I mean, would you deal with thermal and solar? Like, what does that look like in your mind? Well, based on the numbers we're seeing out of this Hiawatha facility, we had White Engineering Group do the, all the energy modeling for that. I don't know if you're familiar with White Engineering. They're very well known. And one of the requirements for the LEED certification was 35% of the electricity had to be renewable. So that's why we bought the wind source program. Well, we're way, we've way over exceeded our electricity usage on the wind source program. In other words, the building's using much less than even what the white group modeled. And we had a pretty cold winter. And yet, it's still, and that's all electric. There are some backup boilers, but it was running nonstop. And yet, I would definitely think if you're starting on a new site, we would definitely go for geothermal if we could. If there's any way to do it. And then I'd love to see solar thermal in there as well. That would be my goal. But my real goal is to get a feed-in tariff. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you for letting me present. And I have cards. I can hand them out if anybody has any other questions in the future. Great to stay around.